The following is an independently produced community access program. The viewpoints expressed are those of the community access producer and do not reflect those of Shaw Cable Systems. The program is presented in response to CRTC policy guidelines regulating community programming. Hello, welcome to today's show. We are going to be talking today about uh, mission style lamps. Generally speaking, mission style lamps are four-sided. Uh, this one beside me is a perfect example. This is a really nice small table lamp. Uh, we're gonna be making a version of this lamp today uh, in our show. Uh, generally, there's a lot of straight lines involved. So that allows me to show you a new tool, which is a ruler. And uh, we're gonna be using this ruler to cut the straight lines in our project. Uh, you can also make larger mission style lamps, such as the one behind me here. Um, this was based on a green and green design from the early 1900s. Uh, they had what they called a dropping cloud design and we incorporated that into this particular piece. So when you're making a lampshade, generally speaking, you want to be able to hide the light bulb. Nothing worse than sitting and reading a book and you're looking at the glare from the light bulb. So what you want to do is choose a glass for the background which is going to hide the bulb and that means it's going to be opalescent. So opalescent glass has got white mixed in it and this will allow uh, us to hide the bulb nicely. It'll still glow really well and actually with any lamp shade, usually the light comes from the bottom of the shade. It doesn't come through the glass itself. So this is a real benefit. Now, the negative is, if you remember from one of our earlier shows when we were cutting glass for our stained glass window, all the glass that we had for that particular project you could see through quite readily. This opalescent glass, that is not the case. When we have our pattern and we put our glass on top of the pattern, we cannot see the lines to cut in that manner. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how to uh, extend the lines on this pattern and use a ruler. So I'm going to take a fine tipped felt pen, I'm, uh, in this case a red one, and I'm going to extend the lines on my pattern. And I know this is not going to make sense until we actually see what I'm going to do with this. But what I want to do is just extend the line so that I will be able to line my ruler up. And I'm going to just cut two pieces like this. So I'll just extend the lines on the two outside pieces. Okay, always put the cap back on your uh, felt pen, they dry out very quickly. So now what I can do is I can take my opalescent glass and um, generally you want to cut it fairly close to the height that you want to cut. Uh, in this case I just grabbed it out of the shelf, so it's a little taller than I need. But with these lines it really doesn't matter. So what I'm going to do is line up the bottom. I'm now going to take my ruler and I'm going to line up, I want to cut the border piece, so I'm going to line up on the inside of this felt pen line. So I check the bottom, check the top, move it over, and then you always, as most carpenters know, you check twice and cut once. So it's really important to remember with a ruler, you use it as a guide, not a crutch. If you are pushing against the ruler, generally you will put your glass cutter on an angle and it is not going to cut properly. And second of all, if you're pushing against the ruler, it's going to move off of where you wanted it to be. So the idea is you hold it very lightly, you line it up, and you just use it as a guide, and you just push forward all the way from top to bottom. Now in this case, I'm going to cut both these uh, sides here because both sides of this piece. I can see them really easily right now, and there's no real disadvantage. I'm not going to be going over the score lines. Now remember, as far as safety goes when you're cutting, you should be wearing either prescription glasses like I am or safety glasses. We're going to take our running pliers. Remember the screw is up. Line it up with my score line, which with this opalescent glass is often quite difficult to see. So I will use my runners to make the one break and now I'll line it up with the second one and make my second break. So you can see it's really easy. Uh, to go along and make those cuts nice and accurate. Now you have to take your time and make sure that you line everything up properly. Now all I have to do here is actually extend my line at the top here, which I didn't do yet, and then I'll be able to cut it to size. So I was lined up at the bottom, so I don't really need to extend the lines there. 
But if I extend the line there, I can line my piece up. And I'm going to do something a little different this time. I'm going to actually use my ruler to line it up, but then I'm just going to make a mark with the felt pen because it's hard to hold a ruler on a small piece like that. Put the lid back on, Brian. Okay, and now I just go along. I make that score. And very quickly, I've got one piece cut perfectly to size. So another thing to keep in mind if you're doing this middle section here is I can line this up. And in this case, I've already got two of my lines cut properly. So all I have to do now is cut this other side. Again, checking twice and cutting once. And then again, I just have to extend the lines there so I can cut off the top. But notice, if I flip my glass over, I now have a piece that is cut perfectly on the one side as well as the top. And now I just have to cut this line here, cut off the bottom. And again, I've got a second one. So if you just keep flipping your pattern over, you have always got two sides of each one of your pieces cut already. So that's what's special about cutting a four-sided lamp. So what I'd like to do now is I'm going to clean off my work table and I'll show you um, how we're going to solder this four-sided lamp together. It's impossible to talk about stained glass in the last 150 years without talking about Lewis Comfort Tiffany. Tiffany was an artist, a decorator, and a fantastic designer. He designed not only stained glass windows, but also his, his family business was Tiffany Jewelers. And he designed a lot of jewelry, a lot of boxes, a lot of, you know, pen holders, a lot of items that people would buy for gifts, etc., uh, for their homes. But today, of course, we want to talk about stained glass. So first of all, I'd like to point out the wonderful, amazing glass that's used in this particular piece. This is one of his absolute uh, penultimate pieces. You can see this peacock. If you look at the, the head of this peacock, the neck, the number of pieces in there, there's, there's, there's hundreds of pieces just in that neck, most of which are of the size of small fingers, fingernail. Um, as we go down, you can see the beautiful glass that's used, the shading. They didn't pick these pieces into, uh, without a lot of forethought. Each one of those pieces was picked because that has a certain shade, a certain movement in the glass, etc. So beautiful, beautiful glass, very small pieces. When you look down to the tail of this piece, you can see how small a lot of those pieces are in the tail of the, the peacock. And of course, this is one of the reasons that Tiffany came up with the copper foil technique. Um, before this, there was large pieces of glass and they were held together using lead came in the uh, form of an H. With Tiffany though, he found that with all these small pieces, the H lead just kind of hid too much of the glass. So by wrapping them in thin pieces of copper foil and soldering over them, he could get all this wonderful detail. Also wonderful glass. If you look in the center of this, he's got what we just talked about, the fracture streamer glass. You can see how that was used to add extra detail through the center of there underneath the trees to give the feeling of the forest floor. If you look at the sky in this particular piece and the water at the bottom, he's used a technique called plating. And what plating uh, means basically is having a single piece of glass on the front, but adding many pieces on the back to add extra detail. So in the sky that's happened and also at the bottom in the water, um, he's used that to great advantage. Also in the trees you can see there's some ripple glass used to create some more interest. This is another tour de force. You can see again the fracture streamer glass in the center, the wonderful plating in the sky and in the water, the tree in the center there with the splotched look that was created by having multiple layers of glass. And something that didn't happen very often, you can see here with the deer, that was actually painted on glass. So there was an artist who um, actually hand painted all the details onto a single piece of glass there. And I think that worked really well because you don't need a lot of small pieces in there. It would probably take away from it if it was broken up. Whereas you can see all the leaves at the top, of course, are a totally different story. Wonderful floral windows. Again, looking at the detail in here, astounding. The colors, the choice of glass, some of the flowers on the right-hand side are used what's called drapery glass. It's hard to tell from this photograph, but some of the folds in the glass are actually half an inch thick. Uh, very difficult to assemble into a window. Tiffany's also really well known for his lamps. This uh, lamp is a beautiful peony design. These were built on wooden forms. They had a, 
a person with a lathe who would actually create the first full-size mold for this. They would then draw into the mold, take their paper patterns off, cut the glass, put them back on the mold, and then solder it on the mold so they would have the proper shape. Again, another beautiful lamp looking at the top, the blue and the purple glass. You cannot separate Tiffany and his glass. The glass that he used was just absolutely phenomenal. So a wonderful artist, wonderful work, and I'm sure if you'd have some time, I would, I would highly recommend you do a little bit more research on, on Tiffany. I would just like to take a moment and go over the soldering process just to refresh your memory. So what I've done is I have cut all my pieces to fit the pattern. And when I was cutting, I was keeping in mind that I wanted to have the space of the black line separating all my pieces so that uh, I, could, uh, I would have a little bit of room to, for fitting. I then took these aluminum push, uh, push pins with my safety block system. I went around the outsides of my pattern, placed my glass on there, and now I'm ready to solder this piece together. So first of all, I take flux, and I'm going to attach, I'm going to put flux wherever the corners, uh, wherever the pieces come together. Take my soldering iron, and it, I'm not really worried about appearance at this point. I just want to join these pieces together. So once I've done that, I can take my piece out of my frame and Keep in mind, don't pull your push pins and your strips out until you've done all the sides of your lamp. I want to be able to put all my pieces in the same, uh, same setup so that they're all going to be exactly the same size. So I can just put this aside and now I'll flux the entire front surface since it's such a small project. And some of the important things again are to first of all just go over everything and fill in the spaces. So we're just going in and we're not worrying about what it looks like. At this point, we're just filling in the spaces. This is such a light piece, it's kind of moving around on me. Again, this has nothing to do with aesthetics. This is just keeping, filling up all the holes and making it so that I've got a nice even surface to start soldering on. So I would finish the whole thing, but let me just go on to, to beading here now. So I will go back and sometimes you need to add more flux. So I have a feeling in this time I'm going to have enough. So I'm just going to go along. You very quickly know if you need more flux. If you find that uh, the glass just isn't grabbing onto, or, you know, onto the foil, then you know you need more flux. On the other hand, if it's spitting and I can hear a little bit of spitting here, that means you've got enough flux and sometimes too much. If it's spitting and leaving little bumps, little caverns, then you know you have too much. So remember that I've got the soldering iron right on the glass. I'm not holding it on top. And notice that my solder is not moving anywhere. It's staying where I want it to be. And I'm pulling. Now I can see I've got a big build up there. So I just pull the soldering iron away or the solder, pardon me, away. And I just continue along until I get to where I join my other piece. And I melt that whole joint. And if I have too much solder, I always just pick it up and flick it off to the side, keeping very, uh, being very cautious, of course, that I don't get it on my, on myself. Okay, so I'm going to continue on. I'm going to solder the front and the back of this one. Now these ones, I've already done that. I've soldered front and back. And I would like to show you how to build up the solder along the bottom edge of this particular piece. So the first thing I do is I get a drop of solder and I draw it along the top surface. This is just to get the color, make sure that it's totally silver in color. And now what I'm going to do is actually bead the top. So I get a, another drop and notice that that drop only goes a small distance. And I'm just going straight up and down. I'm not pulling it along. If I pull it along, the solder is just going to follow me and it's not going to build up. Now, the reason I'm doing this is because once the foil dries out, the glue on the foil dries out, there is nothing that is going to hold that foil onto the glass. So this solder has to be built up enough so that the solder becomes the integral part of the strength and is going to stay on there for as long as this lamp is going to be used. 
And of course, a lot of Tiffany lamps are still around 100 and, you know, plus years later. So it would be nice to think that all of the work that we do is going to become an antiquity. But even if it's not, we want to make sure that it lasts as long as whoever owns it needs it. I am now ready to assemble the four sides of my lamp to make a uh, one complete piece. So the first thing I do is I get my trusty rusty uh, T-square here. And what I want to do is use my layout block system so I have something that I can actually put my pieces against to support them while I'm soldering them into the right shape. So I put one piece on my work table. And I put in the pins. I then line this up uh, with it. I can then take a second piece which I can line up along this other side of the T-square, push in the pins. And in, that, in this case I actually have a third one that I've got ready to go here too. So again I just flip this over and get the third one in place. So at this point I can pick up two of my sections. And what I'm trying to do is I want to make a V in the corner. I want to have the inside edges touching but not the outside because I'm going to have a V that I can fill in with solder. So I'm going to get a drop on the top here. Being very careful, obviously, not to touch my skin. You may find it beneficial to wear kitchen gloves at this point in time. The, the nice thick rubber gloves, they will keep your, if you do happen to uh, touch yourself by mistake, it will uh, prevent you from getting burned. So I've got top and now I've got the bottom held in place. Now I can flip this around so that I can add a third piece. I could have just used my T-square to do this also, but I find that these layout block systems are a little taller and they hold it a little more firmly, which is a real benefit. Okay, so I now have this at a point where it's in the right shape and I can start thinking about soldering the inside and the outside seams to this piece. However, for extra stability, what I'd like to do next is put on a vase cap. The vase cap is what allows us to uh, put this either on a lamp base or if we want to hang it to attach the, the wiring, the swag kit, etc., to hang it as a... Uh, it could be, this could be a nice hall lamp, for example, or we've actually done a number of these to go over um, islands and kitchens. It can be very attractive. If you had two or three of them together, it can be very attractive. So a vase cap comes in uh, only a couple of square sizes. So when we designed this lamp, we designed it so that this one would fit. They also are all made out of brass. And generally speaking, we're going to put black patina or copper patina on this piece. So we're going to want to make sure that the top matches the rest of it. So to do that, what we do is get a thin layer of solder over the entire vase cap. So to do that, we first of all put some flux on it. And we are going to want to add a very thin layer of solder. So what I like to do is start at the top and just go down very slowly. That one drop of solder is going to be enough to do quite a bit of the vase cap here. Now often you have to put flux on a number of times because there is so much heat created here and it does uh, spread across the vase cap and it will evaporate the, uh, the flux. So it's a good idea to keep putting on more flux every once in a while. I don't worry too much about whether this is uh, a little rustic looking because the solder seams on the piece are going to have a little bit of character to them. So a little bit of character on here isn't going to be a negative necessarily. So it's important to take your time, allow it to heat up. Sometimes I'll use two soldering irons. Sometimes with this one actually we can turn it up and have a little more heat because this does tend to really draw the heat. And you have to be very careful when you're reapplying the flux. With that sponge, my hand isn't actually in contact with the metal, so I don't have to worry about burning myself. But um, it's something you have to be conscious of. So far, so good. The lamp is fitting together really nicely. I got the vase cap uh, tinned. 
So there's a thin layer of solder on it and I'm ready to attach the vase cap and then start soldering the, uh, the joining seams of this project. So uh, what I do is I've, I just need to get a little bit of flux in these spots where the corners come together, the vase cap and the lamp. And sometimes it takes a little fair amount of solder to get it to join. So, you know, don't be frugal at this point. You want to make sure that you get a good amount of solder on there. So it's just a matter of turning it around and doing all four corners. I'll just flux all four corners here. Now it is important that this is on straight. You don't want it to be, you know, leaning in any one direction because of course that's the way it's going to sit on the lampshade. So what I normally do is I'll get it to this point and then I will pick it up and look on the inside. And usually by looking on the inside you can see there's four holes here. You can see if those four holes are equidistant from the four sides. If they are, there's a really good chance that you've got it on straight. If it's way over to one side, then you know you're going to have an issue later on. So I'm quite happy with the way this one looks at the moment. So I'll just continue on. When in doubt, add more flux. And this is just, what this does is it keeps everything nice and square when you go to do the uh, soldering for the next phase here. Okay, so now I'm ready to start soldering the inside of the lamp. There's really no trick to doing the inside. Everything is flat. What I'm going to do is I'm going to lay the lamp like this and then I've got a piece of 2 by 4 I'm going to put on one side, a little brush I'm going to put on the other side and that keeps the, uh, the bottom exactly the way I want it. I want it to be like this so that I can fill that in with solder. If you've got it like this, you're going to get the solder more on one side than the other. So we want to have it in a V shape. So I'll just go along and I'll solder the inside of this particular seam. So with it propped up like this, I can just put a small layer of flux on the inside seam. Roll out a bit of solder because I, I don't want to get my hand any further in there than I have to. Soldering iron right on the solder seam. And this is a very thin line as you can see, so it's not going to take much solder to fill this up. So in most cases I'm going to be pulling the solder away every once in a while because I'm going to have excess solder. I think I've got enough to go all the way to the end here. I'm not going to worry about the very end. I'll let that drop go and then I'm going to touch it up later. So I'm quite happy with that except the very beginning I'm just going to touch up a little more. Okay, so that went really well. So now I just pick it up, flip it over, go to the next seam and repeat the same operation. So now that I've got all four of the inside seams soldered, what I'm going to do is start soldering the outside. So to do that, I need to prop it up in a box. So I happen to have a box here that's going to work perfectly. I will just take my lamp and what I need to do is I need to have it going horizontal. If I have it on any kind of an angle, the solder will of course just run down. So what I want to do is I want to place it in the box in such a way that I can achieve my goal. So that looks pretty close to where I want to be. So I'll flux it and I'm going to find out very quickly whether this is going to work or not. This is quite a bit wider seam so this is one I am going to go over it and fill in the solder, fill in the hole first. As you can see, with this particular box being a little bigger than I need, I'm holding it with my one hand as I do it and it's not a very long seam so that's working out pretty well. Okay, so I've got that filled. Now what I can do is go along and try and build this up. And again, I'm just doing my up and down motion. I find that rather than drawing, sometimes that's the best route. I don't want to keep spending a lot of time in one spot because it'll melt through and not only give me a 
imperfect seam on the outside, but it's going to go through and melt the, the uh, underside of this too, and then I'll have to touch up both seams. So once I have basically the right amount of solder in there, I will just flux it one more time and go along and just go up and down just to try and smooth it out a bit. And that's working pretty well. It looks pretty good and smooth. Something rolls off, that's not a problem. And if anything ends up on the glass, you just leave it there. And then later on, when it's cool, you uh, can just remove it by flicking it off with your finger. Remember, the reason we have the copper foil on there is because the solder will not stick to the glass on its own. So as long as it's not going to be attached to a solder seam, it'll come off very easily. So here we have our completed piece, and I really feel good about this particular lamp. Uh, I, I like the glass selection. This ring model glass in the center is a real nice focal point. Uh, by putting this ivory glass around the outside as a frame, I think it draws your eye towards that focal point glass. So all in all, I think that is a, has been very successful. Um, in this show today, we, we learned how to cut it with a ruler, something that's going to be very handy when you're doing any project with straight lines. Uh, we went back over soldering techniques, and I think soldering is something that everybody can improve on, myself in included. You never feel as if you've done the best uh, possible soldering job that you could. We learned how to put the vase cap on. Uh, the one thing that's left to do with this lamp is I will be putting a patina on it, and we will sh be showing that in a future show. So when you finish soldering, the solder, of course, is silver, but we have a choice. We can turn it black, which is what we've done on this lampshade here, uh, by, by putting the patina on and turning uh, the solder black. As you can see, it's not, this lamp is so shiny, your eye is drawn to this, uh, the shiny silver solder. When you put the black patina on it, your eye is drawn to the glass. And of course, that is what we want to emphasize. The glass, not the solder. So we'll be showing you in a future show how you can put black patina on, copper patina, or if you want to leave the, silver, uh, the solder silver, how you can keep it from tarnishing quickly. But what I'd like to do right now is take this lamp off, put our new lamp on, and see exactly how it's going to look when it's when it's finished. Uh, I'd like to point out here that we've got a riser on this particular uh, shade, often the, or base, pardon me. Often the base has come and the harp, uh, which is this section here, is just not high enough. So with the riser, you can get half inch all the way up to two inches. And what that does is it puts our lamp where we want it to be on the base. If it's too low, it looks like it's you know, out of proportion. So we want to bring it up so that we can see none of the, none of the harp, but we can see all of the, the beauty of the shade. So uh, I hope that you were inspired from this particular exercise to go out, get a pattern, get a glass cutter, buy your own glass, and, and try making a nice simple lampshade like this. So thank you very much for joining us and see you next time. The proceeding was an independently produced community access program. The viewpoints expressed are those of the community access producer and do not reflect those of Shaw Cable Systems. The program is presented in response to CRTC policy guidelines regulating community programming.